Order! Order! You are an incorrigible delinquent at times. <laughs> Behave yourself, man! Well, good morning. Welcome to All Out Politics, uh, our second hour of news, debate and opinion. And welcome to the University of Bradford, where in just a few moments the Labour leader, Jeremy Corbyn, uh, is going to launch his party's manifesto for uh, the general election. And we'll find out what changes there have been from the draft copy last week. Already we know that Labour is extending its nationalisation programme uh, to water companies in England. Uh, now, uh, this is the uh, document here. It's called for uh, the many, not the few. Uh, by my count, it's got three pictures uh, of Jeremy Corbyn in it, including uh, the foreword there. Uh, with me is Faisal Islam, because there's also an important second document. Yes, yes, this, this document here is the funding document. Uh, I don't think a political party has done this since the Lib Dems in 2010. They put, like, IFS-style costings in the background. The rough picture is about... Is, is this IFS uh, approved? I, I, I don't... I, uh, some of it is using Treasury figures, some of it's using National Audit Office figures. I don't think it is IFS approved, but basically we're talking about sort of massive spending commitments, 50, 50 billion paid for <coughs> by 50 billion in tax measures, all the things that we have been talking about that were in the draft mani uh, manifesto. Some interesting costings. I mean, uh, the biggest single move is the corporation tax raise from 90p up to 26p, which Labour say will still leave it at the lowest level in the G7, but claim it will yield £19 billion. That's on the basis that no one moves abroad. That's a, what they call a right. static so cost. Like but spending, the biggest single thing is the tuition fees removing and restoring maintenance grants. That comes in for a whopping £11 billion. So the question is, some people might argue, for the many, not the few, actually, is that a policy that is laser-guided on the very poorest? Is it as progressive as you might think that Jeremy Corbyn would want to be? Other policies, increasing funding for schools, six billion, childcare, five billion, um, abolishing the EMA, uh, the education maintenance. Sorry, yeah. reintroducing the EMA, I should say. And about two billion. And these, they, just to be clear, we've got pictures here of Jeremy Corbyn arriving uh, in a rather rainy Bradford with his shadow Yay! cabinet uh, on board a coach. When we quote these billion yeah, figures, this is for the Parliament, is it, or for one year? That's for what? Uh, that's in one year. One that's year. in one year. So I think I would suggest that this is by the end of the Parliament. Parliament. Yes, by the end of the Parliament, 2021 to 2022. So this is by the end. So these things will kind of ramp up or ramp up. But by down. the end of the Parliament, yeah. the annual overall tax take would be up 50 billion. 49 billion. 49 and billion. And the spending also up exactly the same. That doesn't give a great deal of wriggle room if, for example, the corporation tax impact on companies is that some of them move abroad. Certainly a low corporation tax has attracted a proportion of mobile yeah. multinationals. And, uh, and, so, that, you know, uh, but they and, claim that they can raise that. Yeah, and million. just on rule of thumb, I think 1p on the basic rate of income tax is worth about 2 billion. Is that uh, right? No, about 5 billion now. 5 billion, 5 billion right? Billion, yeah. So this is the equivalent of 10p on the basic rate of income tax. Uh, I mean, it's not, they're not how yes, they're going to raise it. But yes, that, yes, yes, yes. Focused on corporation tax, excessive pay levy, income taxes for the top 5%, tax avoidance gets 6 billion. That was quite sceptical. Actually, I have to say, they have put in an allowance for additional behavioural change and uncertainty. So, in fact, they've scored 52 billion worth of tax rises. Anyway, these are big relative moves and so no one can deny that there's not going to be a, a stark choice. Now, on the nationalisations that you raised, they aren't included in these costings. These are current spending, current tax raising uh, costings. Uh, things like taking rail, mail, water. Uh, water, bits of energy into the public sector or introducing public sector competitors they uh, would come where there is a cost from the capital budget and Labour's fiscal policy would, although they can't really borrow in order to fund current spending, that's why they've had to balance it off, for what would be deemed a capital investment, 
they can borrow. So essentially they're going to borrow that money. Let's just listen to uh, what the Shadow Chancellor, John McDonnell, has been saying this morning about this manifesto and the costings. But for 95% of earners, there'll be no increase in income tax, there'll be no increase in VAT or national insurance contributions. For those, that top 5% of higher earners, we're asking for a modest additional contribution to help us, well, help us save our public services from crisis. Uh, I mean, Faisal, the slogan here is for the many, not the few. And the message from John McDonnell is it's only the top 5% of earners who would be paying more and businesses. Uh, is that right? I mean, can we say that most people uh, won't feel the pain? In fact, they'll feel gain in terms of improved public services if this is ever implemented. So, uh, many economists say when you levy a tax on a business, eventually it might wash through into the, the fees that are paid for these private sector businesses. But the first incidence of these tax rises uh, seems to have been uh, constructed so that Jeremy Corbyn and John McDonnell can say actually we're only taxing businesses we're only taxing the, the really wealthy the interesting one I just need to check the um, detail on this is the pulling down of the additional rate um, if that gets pulled down to 80,000 and that is still the, the, the top 5% of earners um, but perception amongst some in swing seats is that that isn't that that's it's certainly not an average wage it's certainly a high wage but it's it, it, the question is from conserv conservatives would argue well you know we can we can say that 80,000 is an aspirational wage for many more people than just uh, just the high earners i should say some interesting things in the background we can see a kind of a pen of people with protest placards i haven't seen that handwritten protest placards at the back i haven't seen that at a manifesto launch before uh, you can they're just not make, protesting against. They're the not protesting against. No, no, no. Manifesto. They're protesting for. for. Yeah, on things like auster uh, against austerity. I think you can just make out Hillary Benn, a vaguely local MP, just standing right at the back, with his back against the glass uh, wall. There, you see him over there. Uh, we're waiting for the shadow cabinet to turn up as well. Um, significant, as you say, on the front page of the manifesto. No picture of Jeremy Corbyn. I expect some contrast from the Conservative manifesto uh, when we get it later this week. But there are some photographs of the Labour leader in the pages of the manifesto. We've also had some costing, some reaction from the Institute for Fiscal Studies this morning. Uh, yeah. I believe. What are they saying about Labour's proposal? Well, they have said in the past that this is the biggest intervention in the state uh, of, uh, uh, in a major party's manifesto since the 1970s. Uh, they also have uh, costed the tuition fees at eight billion a year. Actually, uh, Labour say it's 11 billion. I mean, that's a huge amount for one policy. And you think about just electoral maths of that. I mean, the sorts of seats that swung because of student antipathy towards tuition fees, they're quite concentrated. They're the sort of Cambridges, the Oxfords, the uh, Bristols, you know, they're, but they're not, they're, they're not dozens and dozens of seats. And it depends on students registering to vote. So it's, it's, it's an expensive policy for how many seats you might think you can get out of it. Yeah. But it's a big one. And well, it, and it also won't be retrospective, will it? So if you've got a no. student loan now, you're stuck with it. Yes, that would seem to be the case. I mean, that would be hugely expensive to try yeah. to do that. Um, I, and I, I'm, just, sorry, I'm just trying to look up the, uh, the, tax, uh, the tax policy, the precise thing on... They're also announcing some uh, social security... Uh, some reversals of social security cuts that have been planned. So employment support allowance increased by £30 a week, scrapping the bedroom tax, um, implementing the PIP legal ruling. This is the thing that got George Osborne into trouble um, uh, when Ian Duncan Smith resigned. Um, restoring housing benefit for the under 21s, two billion of additional funding for universal credit, uprate carers allowance. That costs four billion a year by 2022. Doubling paternity pay is another one. And on state pensions, uh, they are not just uh, accepting the triple lock, they're also going to uprate state pensions for British pensioners overseas and extend the pension credit. Yeah. The big announcement that uh, they hope will garner many votes 
will be lifting the public sector pay cap. Now, people which will has cost four billion. People will compare this to 1983 and Michael Foote's uh, manifesto that became known as the longest suicide note in history. Uh, this is a different document. It's A5. Uh, and I think it's fair to point out that in many ways the policies are more centrist than what there was then. I mean, for example, on defence, uh, just confirming what was leaked in advance, uh, the last Labour government consistently spent above the NATO benchmark of 2% of GDP. Uh, Labour's commitment to spending at least 2% of GDP on defence uh, will guarantee that our armed forces have the necessary capabilities. Labour supports the renewal of the Trident nuclear yeah, deterrent. Yeah. So all of that is there. Uh, yes. In fact, there are a number of times where there's, a, there's what you might say a sort of left-wing populist wrapper around a policy that has been pursued by uh, mainstream social democratic parties. And they're not saying abolish the monarchy, for example. They're not saying, they're not saying things like that, which is in 83. Yeah. But you take the, the so-called nationalisations, you take rail, the idea of um, letting the uh, rail franchises expire and then inheriting them, you know, that is not seizing the rail infrastructure, that is letting them expire. And it happened it will happen because there were financial troubles, but it happened on the Great North Eastern Railway, made a profit for the government. That's the sort of argument that they'll be trying to push. You take water, although there's clearly a question mark about how you fund uh, the purchase of companies worth tens of billions of pounds, a big question mark. Um, the idea of publicly owned water companies, well, they exist. Scotland, Northern Ireland and Wales already. So uh, if he can reorientate... Here we go. The start of Labour's manifesto launch, uh, the shadow cabinet coming on uh, first to sit either side of the podium where Jeremy Corbyn will speak. It's an attractive venue here at the University of Bradford and uh, up in the galleries uh, there are many students and people working at the university who are watching and now uh, Sarah you. Champion, the equality spokesman, is going to introduce uh, today's events. Thank you all so much for that amazing welcome. But I have to say it's something that both Jeremy and the whole team have been getting across the country and we are so grateful for that. Thank you all very much. Good morning and welcome. I'd love to say to a sunny Yorkshire, but good morning and welcome to Yorkshire and to this fantastic space. My name is Sarah Champion. I'm proud to be a member of Labour's Shadow Cabinet. Thank you. <laughs> Firstly, I want to thank everyone from Bradford University involved in organising this event. And also, thank you to all of you for coming. <laughs> Today, you will hear in detail about Labour's programme for government. A government for the many, not the few. Shortly, you'll be hearing from the leader of the Labour Party and Britain's next Prime Minister. <laughs> but first, I think it's only right that we hear from two local residents who are going to share with us their personal stories about why they need 
a Labour government elected on the 8th of June. So firstly, please give a warm welcome to Martin. My name is Martin Kilgallen. I was born in Bradford Royal Infirmary in 1973. I am the father of five children and the managing director of a family business in Batley employing 40 people. My eldest son, Mason, has brittle asthma and has been admitted to hospital eight times in the last three months. In the past, he has suffered from a respiratory arrest. Each time we visit hospital, we are met with mayhem, the A&E departments are understaffed, ambulances are queuing and doctors don't have time to explain what's going on. Two of my younger sons, Tolan, who is six, and Freddie, who is five, have been diagnosed at the severe end of the autistic spectrum. Both are unable to speak. We knew from an early age that Tolan was different and asked our GP for help. After much toing and froing, we were finally referred to a paediatrician who added Tolan to an autism diagnosis waiting list. At the time, that was three years long. We tried again and again to make our case to the local NHS about these waiting times, but we're always met with the same apologies, there's no money for this. In 2011, Freddie was born, and by 2013, he was showing signs of autism. Again, after a battle, we were added to yet another three-year waiting list. Thanks to the intervention from the late Joe Cox, Freddie received his diagnosis in 2016. During this time in my life, I would work until seven or eight at night, and on arriving at home, the first thing I'd do was open a bottle of red wine. To a lot of people, a bottle of red wine every night isn't a lot, but I knew this wasn't for me, and I sought help from the local doctor. There was no support for this. I wasn't an alcoholic. One Sunday night in 2014, things finally got to me, and I took a walk on the hard shoulder of the M62. I don't know how I managed to get there, but the intended outcome was to end my own life. Fortunately, I didn't. With the help of some private intervention from a gent called Thomas Fitzsimons, I gave up drinking. I spoke at great length with my wife, and we realised we were both suffering from severe depression. We set up a support group for parents of autistic children in October 2014. This has now become a charity called the Whole Autism Family, and only last week received an award from the Duke of York. The charity was set up because we didn't want parents to go through the same issues we had with no support available. We are now in the process of moving Tolan and Freddie back to a special needs school. The local school they attend say they cannot meet their needs. We had a meeting with the special school last week and have been told they can't go there, that school's full. The team in charge of this at the council have informed us that the other special schools are all over numbers. We are currently paying towards one of, to one-to-one -one care to ensure both of our boys are kept safe while at school. Tolan is only to, able to attend school twice a week and Freddie four days. In every meeting with the special needs team, they tell me they don't have the finances to do anything different. On Sundays, both of our boys attend a respite centre. There was recently consultation to close this down in an attempt to save £500,000 a year. This service is safe for now, only because there isn't anything to replace it. I spoke on Sunday to the manager. She is running on a zero budget and being asked to make further savings. We meet with other parents at the support group. Most have had to give up work due to their child's needs. I regularly see grown men and women cry. Dealing with a disability or special needs is hard enough and doesn't need to be made harder by the reduction of vital services. Something has to change. A Labour government will fully fund the NHS, giving it the money it needs. They will provide emergency funding to address the social care crisis, as well as develop a fully funded social care model over the longer run. It will stop cuts to school budgets and introduce new schools funding formula that is truly fair to develop a world-class education for every child. Labour will develop a better, fairer Britain. This is why I'm voting Labour at this election. I'd like now to welcome Mohammed to the stage. Thank you. Comrades, sisters, brothers, 
colleagues. Good morning. Peace be with you all. My name is Mohammed Azam and I'm a bus driver. I'm from Oldham and I'm a former Labour Party councillor. I'm also a proud dad, but I'm also a worried dad. Worried about the future. My kids, three of whom have graduated from university, two who are currently in university, what are they going to come out with after university? There are very few jobs they can go into, but they will have a massive debt on their shoulders. Is that the kind of future I envisage for them? Actually, no. I wanted my kids to do better than me. I, as a bus driver, have no debt. Yet my kids, who are better educated and should have better opportunities, have got massive debts. That's not the kind of future I need for my kids or for anybody else's kids. The Tories have been holding us back and putting a cap on our kids' ambitions. How will they afford homes of their own? How will they manage the debt? How can they live a richer life? That's why I'm proud to be a Labour Party activist, somebody who wants to bring about peace and prosperity, not just for my kids and my neighbourhood, for the whole world. That is why the Labour Party under Jeremy Corbyn is now proposing a future where there is hope for everybody. No community will be left behind. This is a party that stands for the many and not the few. You will hear more details in a short while, but I can tell you, for me as a worker and my colleagues in the bus industry, the proposals that are already leaked out have been really enthusiastic for us. £10 an hour, how many people is that going to lift out of the poverty? That's going to do a huge amount of favour for the communities that I live in, £10 an hour. Add to that extra four days bank holidays. Bank holidays for those people who want time off to spend with their families are needed and we will be able to enjoy that. There are a whole host of other proposals that I'm sure I don't want to take the thunder from people who will introduce them to you. But I think housing, work, security at work, dignity and a peaceful world is something that we all aspire to. And that is why I'm out up and down the country trying to help my colleagues from the Labour Party to get elected so we can have on June the 8th a Labour Party government that serves the many and not the few. <laughs> colleagues, colleagues, my message today is quite clear. It's short and sweet. We have very little time. The media is not going to do our job. We need to be on the doorstep. We need to be talking to people our communities, our colleagues, we need to be telling them how bad the next Tory government will be if they get in. And on the other hand, we have hope with this Labour Party, the colleagues here who will form the next government, I am sure they will be able to deliver, not just for our communities, not just for me and my kids, but everybody in this room and everybody in this country. That's the kind of future I'm looking forward to. That's the kind of future I ask everybody to work towards. We have very little time. We need to get out there and do our work. So colleagues, we know this manifesto is going to deliver for us. Please take the time out there and do whatever you can. We need a government that will be on our side. I need a Labour government that's going to get my kids out of the debt, out of the poverty, out of the situation that I find for them. I worry for their future. 
And I know many more people up and down the country worry about the future too. Let's end the worrying. Let's start looking forward to a brighter future. Let's look forward to a Labour government on June the 9th. But we have to do work for that. Colleagues, my message is clear. Let us go for peace and prosperity and not what the Tories offer, war on austerity. So let's get out there and do our work. Thank you for giving me this opportunity and listening to me. And now can I invite Christine to say a few words? Christine. Hello, my name's Christine and I live in Cleckie and not far from Bradford. I'm a busy working mum of two girls. Like all parents, I work hard to make sure they have everything they need. As a single parent and a carer for my girl's grandma, so sometimes I have additional challenges. Work needs to fit around looking after the girls and their grandma. So I used to work all kinds of shift patterns at a bookies, and now they're a bit older, I've started working nights at a hotel. But even though I work hard, after paying for food, the rent and bills, there is not much left. Sometimes there's not even enough, full stop. I know I'm not the only person who has to deal with these challenges and took after their family, but, and I don't think I'm the only one who feels like it shouldn't be this hard. The Tories are taking the country backwards, but I want better opportunities for me and my family. I want my girls to have more opportunities and not fewer. I want a party and government that stands up for people. I want a government that works for the many, not the few. This general election is a clear choice between the Labour Party, who will st stand up for working people, and the Tory party who are failing us. I will be voting Labour on June the 8th for the good of my family and I hope you will do too. I am delighted to introduce the leader of the Labour Party and our next Prime Minister, Jeremy Corbyn. Can I say, first of all, thank you so much to everyone for coming here today. And thank you to Bradford University for giving us this space this morning and had a lovely conversation with Professor Brian Cantor, the Vice Chancellor of the University. And I think this university is a great place, going great places. Thank you very much for giving us the space this morning. <clears throat> And thank you to everyone in Bradford and indeed all across Yorkshire over the campaigning over the last few days. What a fantastic welcome we've had. What fantastic support we've received. And so many people tell me so much about the hopes they have in our manifesto, in our plans, in all of us. We intend to deliver on those hopes and on these plans. And thank you to Brian, Mohammed, and Christian, Christine for what you just said and the bravery with which you spoke about your own problems and demons because I am determined that we will deal with, address, and confront the issues of the mental health crisis facing this country so people don't face it and suffer alone. Thank you for what you said this morning. I also want to say a big thank you to all those that contributed to our manifesto. Those in our teams, in the Labour Party head office, in my team, that put such amazing amounts of work into producing a very good manifesto in a very short space of time. Well done to all of them, and thank you to all the different 
society groups, civil society organizations, so many others that sent in really good ideas to us which have helped to frame our thinking and frame our ideas and of course the members and affiliated trade unions of the Labour Party. And I also want to say thank you to the party's national executive for the huge work they put in on this and a very deep appreciation to all my colleagues who are here today in our shadow cabinet. They've put enormous a message across into contributing to our manifesto. And if you look at our shadow cabinet, you see experience, you see diversity, you see age range, you see people whose life experience is rooted in real life experience, who will never forget that when they're holding great offices of state to deliver for the people that put them there. Thank you very much to all of my colleagues in the shadow cabinet. And, of course, it's an absolute pleasure to be here in Bradford to launch this manifesto for the many, not the few. Because Bradford University had a chancellor for a long time, and a great chancellor he was. He was Harold Wilson, a former Labour Prime Minister. <laughs> who, whilst not born in Bradford, saw the strength and the values of this fantastic city. And Harold, as Prime Minister, did so much to expand university education and make it accessible for all. And his greatest legacy, I believe, is the open university and the access that gives to everybody to go into higher education if that's what they wish to do at any stage in their lives. And so I think today we're setting out a manifesto to transform the 21st century in the same way that Harold Wilson in the 1960s sought to transform the 20th century. And it's an absolute pleasure to be here today. This uh, manifesto is a draft for a better future for our country. It's a blueprint of what Britain could be and a pledge of the difference a Labour government can and will make. Like thousands of other Labour Party members, I've been making the case to people across the country over the last few weeks. This is a manifesto for all generations. We're providing hope and genuine opportunity for everybody. I say to our children, whatever the postcode you were born in, we will make sure you have the same chance as every other child. And I have to say, as the days turn into weeks, as this campaign has continued, opinion is changing and it's moving towards Labour. And actually, there is no secret as to the reason for that. Because people want a country run for the benefit of the many, not the few. That's because for the last seven years, our people have lived through the opposite, a Britain for the rich and the elite and the vested interests. They've benefited from tax cuts, bumper salaries, and millions have struggled at the same time. Whatever your age or situation, people are under pressure, struggling to make ends meet. Our manifesto is for you. Parents worrying about the prospects of their children and anxious about the growing needs of their elderly parents. Young people struggling to find a secure job and despairing of ever getting a home of their own. Children growing up in poverty. Students leaving college burdened with debt. Workers who've gone years without a real pay rise and stretching family budgets just to survive. Labour's mission over the next five years is to change all of that. Our manifesto sets out how, with a programme that is radical and responsible, a programme that will reverse our national priorities, 
and put the interests of the many first. We will change our country while managing within our means and will lead us through Brexit while putting the preservation of jobs first. Let me highlight just a few of our key pledges. And believe it or not, you may have read them already. <laughs> if you're an assiduous reader of newspapers. We're ruling out rises in VAT and national insurance and on income tax for all but 5% of the highest earners. Labour will boost the wages of 5.7 million people earning less than the living wage to £10 an hour by 2020. <laughs> Labour will end the cuts in the National Health Service and deliver safe staffing levels and reduce waiting lists. <laughs> Labour will scrap tuition fees, lifting the debt. And that will lift the debt cloud from hundreds of thousands of young people. Labour will move towards universal childcare, expanding free provision for two, three and four-year-olds in the next Parliament. Labour is guaranteeing the triple lock to protect pensioners' incomes. And we will build over a million new homes, at least half of them for social rent. <laughs> Labour makes no apology for offering new protections to people at work, including ending the scandal of zero hours contracts. <laughs> And we make no apology for finding the resources to hire 10,000 new police officers and 3,000 new firefighters. And we will do the smaller things that can make a real difference, like ending hospital car parking charges or introducing four extra... Four extra public holidays every year. But we in the Labour Party recognise that dealing with and solving these problems requires a thriving economy, one that gets our economy working again and rises to the challenges of Brexit on jobs and investment. For seven years, the Conservatives have been holding Britain back. Low investment, low wages, low growth. Labour will move Britain to forward with ambitious plans to unlock this country's potential. We will set up a national investment bank and regional development banks to finance growth and good jobs for all parts of the United Kingdom. through the funding of major capital projects. Labour will also invest in our young people through a national education service focused on childcare, schools and skills, giving them the capacity to make a productive contribution to tomorrow's economy. And Labour will take our railways back into public ownership and put passengers first.
We will take back control of our country's water by bringing them into regional public ownership. And we will take a public stake in the energy sector to keep fuel prices down and ensure a balanced and green energy policy for the future. The Tories now want to scare us into accepting more of the same. Only Labour has a plan ambitious enough to unleash this country's potential. And only Labour has the plan to make Brexit work for ordinary people. We are clear there is now a choice. Labour Brexit that puts jobs first, or a Tory Brexit that will be geared towards the interests of the City of London and risk making Britain a low-wage tax haven. As we leave the EU, because that is what the people have voted for, only Labour will negotiate a deal that preserves jobs, access the single market and preserves rights and access, not plunge our country into a race to the bottom. All this is costed as the documents accompanying our manifesto make very, very clear. Our revenue raising plans ensure we can embark on this ambitious programme without jeopardising our national finances. We're asking the better off and the big corporations to pay a little bit more. And of course, to stop dodging their tax obligations in the first place. And in the longer term, we look to a faster rate of growth driven by increased private and public investment to keep our accounts in shape. This is a program of hope. The Tory campaign, by contrast, is built on one word, fear. What would another five years of Conservative government mean for Britain? Just just look back at the last seven. More children living in poverty. Fewer young people able to buy their first home. More people queuing at food banks. Fewer police on the beat. Fewer firefighters too. More people are in work, but they're not getting the pay or the hours to make ends meet more young people in debt. Will the Tories change their spots? Don't bank on it. Their record says they won't. The Prime Minister will disagree, of course, so I say to her today in the most polite and friendly way possible, <laughs> come out of hiding and let's have a debate. <laughs> Let's have, a, let's have a polite, respectful debate on television so millions of people can make up their own minds about which party offers better hope for Britain. Let's debate. Let's debate our two manifestos. Have the discussion. I'm confident that once the people of this country get the chance to study the issues, look at the promises, they will decide that Britain has indeed been held back by the Conservative government. They have prevailed over the many for far too long. And 
that they will decide it's now time for Labour. Our country, our country will only work for the many, not the few, if opportunity is in the hands of the many. So our manifesto is a plan for everyone. Have a fair chance to get on in life, because our country will only succeed when everyone succeeds. This message is for everyone in this country, be they young, be they middle-aged, or be they old. We want that inclusive society that cares for all. And as I said at the start of my speech, we are determined that a child's future is not decided by the place of birth, that a child's future is not decided by the underfunding of their primary school. A child's future is not decided by the poverty of their community. A government that invests for all a government with the vision to ensure that the brilliance and imagination of every child can be fulfilled during their lifetime. Our proposal is a government for the many, not the few. Our proposals are of hope for the many all over this country. And I'm very proud to present our manifesto for the many, not the few. Thank you very much. So a, rap so, so a rapturous reception as Jeremy Corbyn launches Labour's manifesto. He didn't hold up the separate document that Labour's produced uh, called Funding Britain's Future. Uh, and just on the tax measures, when he said uh, corporations and the better off uh, were being asked to pay a little bit more, uh, here are the figures from uh, Labour's own document. Uh, corporation tax... 19.4 billion increase, income tax increases 6.4 billion, excessive pay levy 1.3 billion, offshore company property level 1.6 billion, tax avoidance programme 6.5 billion, extension of stamp duty 5.6 billion. Now Sarah Champion, uh, the MP and uh, or the former MP and candidate in this election and the party's equality spokesman is chairing uh, the press conference, which looks as if there's going to be questions from the press and from uh, supporters. The manifesto um, is wonderful to hear. I've been waiting for 30 years to hear something like this that I could believe in and fight for. The question, though, is we have a huge issue in our area, which is fracking. We're delighted to see it in the manifesto and we'd love to hear you say it as well. <laughs> Thank you. Um, gentleman behind you, please. The gentleman with the tie. Thanks very much. Uh, Andy Bell, Channel 5 News. Um, Mr Corbyn, I know you don't want to set a target for immigration. Right, sorry. That's more like it. Andy Bell, Channel 5 News. Jeremy Corbyn, I know you don't want to set a target number for immigration, but can you simply say if you think it would be good for the country if the immigration level was reduced, if immigration came down. And um, finally, uh, Laura. No, 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 please, no, please, nice. let's have respect for everyone who wants to ask a question, including members of the media. By the way, I'm a member of the NUJ. <laughs> um, Laura. Thank you. Um, Laura Koonsberg, BBC News. Um, Mr. Corbyn, to be crystal clear for our viewers, for good or for ill, you think it's time to pay for your ideas, to tax more, to spend more, and to borrow more. First of all, thank you very much. The manifesto is absolutely clear. We believe that fracking is very damaging to the environment, and therefore Barry Gardner has made the statements on that, and I'm sure you understand and accept them and the way that Barry has put them. And I thank Barry for the work that he's done on it. 
He's nodding in agreement, so it must be true. Uh, on the issue of immigration, there is immigration from all parts of the world. Those that have migrated to this country have made an immense, enormous and fantastic contribution to our society. Without those that have... <laughs> those nurses that came from Jamaica, those doctors that came from India, those specialists that come from Germany, those that work in all aspects of our National Health Service, Education Service, industry, transport and so much else have helped to give us the living standards that we all have and I think we should recognise our country owes them a great deal of debt and thanks for what they've done. <laughs> We've also made it clear that people should not be brought into this country to work in poor conditions, on low wages, deliberately to undercut people that are already here in work on agreed conditions. <laughs> and that the free movement that currently exists within the European Union, obviously at the time we leave the European Union, that free movement doesn't continue. We will negotiate a trade agreement with the European Union that will ensure tariff-free access to the European Union and future migration will be based on a fair migration policy, a fairness towards our economy and our needs of our people and an end to the undercutting and exploitation that goes with it. And I believe that a Home Office led by Diane Abbott will be fair and decent and reasonable in the way that it runs it. But bear in mind, if there hadn't been people coming here to work in our NHS, all of us would be in far worse health than we are at the present time. Let's remember that. And Laura, and Laura, thanks very much for your question and thanks for the way you put it. What we're proposing here is a rebalancing our economy, a rebalancing so that there is proper levels of investment in infrastructure fairly across the whole of the UK, not totally in the London and the South East, but in every region of the country. And I think that is extremely important. And a national investment bank that will ensure that fairness is taken all the way through it. We will also be, yes, increasing wages through the living wage, a living wage of £10 an hour by 2020. That will actually lead to economic growth and higher spending within the economy. It will also lead to a slight reduction in, um, in work benefits because of higher wages, but it will also help to rebalance our society. And from a government that has um, borrowed more than every Labour government in history over the past seven years, we really don't need lectures. We really don't need lectures from the, Tories, from the Tories on this. We're there to invest for the future and invest for the good of all and to ensure there is fairness across communities and across the regions of Britain. And you know what? Every other country in the world says, why does Britain invest so little and pay itself so little while it allows such grotesque levels of inequality to get worse? Let's turn it round and do it the other way. Thank you. Um, I've got a lady on the very back row, the gentleman who has the most splendid moustache I've ever seen, and uh, the gentleman What's on the front row, mine? second most lovely. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Jeremy. Um, I'm just wondering, is there any provisions, um, Scarlett over here, um, is there any provisions um, to basically fix the failing academies that we already have in our system for schools? Because my son is now 18, and he came out with no GCSEs because the schools failed him. Uh, Peter Lazenby, Morning Star newspaper. Can anything be done about the shockingly biased media?
Hi, Jeremy. One of the problems people face in society, I think, is economic isolation. We see the number of high street banks that are closing down. You think it'd be a good idea if there was a, a network of banks on the high street, maybe utilising post offices to provide a bank for the people? Thank you very much, Jeremy. Um, Scarlett, thanks very much for your question. Um, we don't want to close schools. Indeed, we want to see there is proper investment in schools all across the country. And under Labour, head teachers won't be asked to take collections at the school gate in order to pay for teachers' salaries and teaching assistants' salaries. We will ensure there is decent and fair funding of all schools across Britain, not what is happening now, which is funding per pupil is being cut in the vast majority of schools, and the schools are paying the price for that with oversized and supersized classes, overstretched teachers, and an insufficiency of teaching assistants and so many other staff within the school. We will ensure our schools are properly funded. Secondly, where the <laughs> where there are schools that are failing, then I believe, and I'm sure Angela would agree with me on this, there has to be a, an effective and strong local education authority that can step in to make sure that the schools are properly funded. Because we are not convinced of the idea that every school should be accountable only to the Department of Education. We want a much stronger local community and family of schools and education. So we would want to bring free schools and academies within that family of local education in a mutually supportive environment. Because at its best, at its best, if one school recognises it's got a problem of achievement in, say, English or maths, then a school down the road might be doing very well in those areas. You learn from each other. But if you create competition between schools all the time, you reduce the ability to learn from each other. Our children need to grow up knowing that the whole community is working for them. To quote the African proverb, it takes a village to bring up a child, not just the parents immediately with them. And since you so kindly brought up the question of education, Tom Watson and I have just been discussing on our wonderful campaign bus coming here how exciting it's going to be when we introduce the pupil arts premium so that every child gets a chance to learn a musical instrument in school. Uh, Peter, thanks very much for your question. Um, You've noticed that some of the media are slightly biased against the Labour Party. This is sometimes said to be the case. Listen, um, we're very serious about ensuring there is freedom of information and a right to know in society. It was, after all, Labour who introduced the Freedom of Information Act. We also recognise that in many societies around the world, very brave journalists lose their lives or are assassinated because they've uncovered the truth about brutal regimes and abuses of human rights. Journalists and journalism and free journalism and free press are intrinsic to a democracy and a free society. I fully understand that. But it's also important to ensure there is responsible journalism, that there is a multiplicity of ownership, that there is a right of reply, and there isn't an abuse of monopoly power within it. And so we would develop Leveson, and Tom Watson is very clear on this, that we will protect the diversity of our free press, and we will ensure there is diversity of all of our media outlets in this country, so that everybody can take an informed opinion. And the point that uh, Tony Cairns raised at the end about economic isolation. John McDonnell has put forward a very clear view that a high street bank is actually something that's quite important. It's part of our community. If you think about it, there's too many small towns, even medium-sized towns, where the town centre has been hollowed out, where various shops go, the banks go, and 
you get to a whole process of decline and you end up with a town centre that is little else. It's quite complicated, but with intelligent planning and good support, you can end up with a much more vibrant and effective town centres all across the country. And so John's proposal is that banks shouldn't be allowed willy-nilly just to close all their branches and leave some towns with no bank whatsoever. There's also the question of the promotion of um, other banks as well. Credit unions have grown a great deal in our society. I'm indeed a member of a credit union myself because I think they're a great way of helping people financially manage and helping them to get credit if they need it and get loans if they need it. I think those things are very important. There is also the role of the post office in this as an alternative source of banking and indeed it was the Labour government of Harold Wilson that introduced the gyro account system in those days and so we'd be looking in, alongside the question of public ownership of Royal Mail up to the role that the post office will play in assisting people to get good banking and again that means you've got to keep post offices on the high streets of all our towns and cities in Britain. Thank you. Um, the next three, I am just going to go to journalists to prove how unbiased they are. Uh, so I've got uh, Robert, I've got Sky, I've got Jack. Sorry, I'm going for Jack instead. <laughs> Who's first? Uh, Robert's first, please. Robert. Um, uh, hello. Hi, Robert. Um, a couple of things. Most forecasters say that the main reason why the living standards of those on lower pay is set to fall over the next few years is because of the freeze on benefits. And I'm struck that you haven't promised to end the benefits freeze. Why didn't you choose to do that in your programme? And secondly, you've set out plans to spend about £50 billion a year more and tax companies and the rich by around £50 billion a year more. You've also got an ambitious programme of investment and an extension of public ownership to energy, the Royal Mail, water. How much do you intend to borrow additionally every year? Thank you. Yes, um, Faisal Islam, Sky News. Mr. Corbyn. Hello. Oh, hi. hi um, so you've described the manifesto as radical. The Independent Institute of Fiscal Studies has said that this is the biggest involvement of a government in the state since the 1970s. At, at the last election just two years ago, two million more voters felt that the Labour Party was too radical and insufficiently irresponsible. Why, outside of this hall, and the swing voters who will determine the election, why should they trust you to set their water rates, their gas bills, and their train fares. Thank you, and Jack. Thank you, uh, Jack Blanchard from The Mirror. Um, Mr. Colby, when the manifesto leaked last week, a lot of these um, policies we put to an opinion poll and they proved to be wildly popular. A vast majority of them people really, really like, but what they didn't like was you as leader. Why do you think that is? Okay. Thanks for your question, Jack. It's all right, it's all right. It's not the cult of personality, don't worry about it. <laughs> uh, Ro Robert, thanks very much for your, your question. Yes, increasing benefits is important, and clearly we're not going to freeze benefits. That is very clear. We're also looking at the perverse effects of the benefit cap on people and their housing accommodation, particularly in London and the centre of our big cities. You will be hearing more about that in the very near future. Secondly, um, on um, borrowing and investment, I've made it very clear that this government has borrowed because it hasn't invested, and it's borrowed more and more because it's invested less and less, and we end up with a process of almost managed economic decline relative to what we could achieve as a result of that. And so we're going to make it very, very clear that this will be a government that invests for the future in all parts of the country because we have a grossly imbalanced process where the vast majority of transport infrastructure investment goes to London and the South East. And so one of our key commitments is a crossrail for the North from Manchester across to Newcastle. 
Um, uh, Faisal and Jack, your, your questions are actually the mirror images of each other. Did you get together to um, decide who was going to ask which? No, it's all right. That's a joke. Don't worry about it. Um, when people talk about the 1970s uh, and our manifesto doing that, I, I simply say that the other major party contesting this election is really, really forward-looking. They're going to bring back fox hunting and grammar schools. That sounds really 21st century, doesn't it? And so, yes, I've made it very clear, and John McDonnell will set out this in, in great detail tomorrow. Every one of our commitments is costed and funded. All of our borrowing commitments are there, out there in the open of what we would do. And you say the manifesto was leaked last week. Yes, um, many people got an advanced copy of it. We're, well, they read it anyway. Um, and um, the opinion polls that have tested the uh, policies individually have found them all to be very, very popular indeed. I just say this. I am very, very proud to lead this party. I was elected by a very large number of members and supporters, ordinary people, all over this country, in trade unions, Labour supporters, Labour Party members. And I'm very proud that we have a party that is diverse, that is inclusive, that is pluralistic. And this manifesto, this manifesto is a product of that process. I see leadership as not dictating, but leadership is also about listening. Listening to what people say, understanding the stress, the pressures, and the tensions in their lives, and ensuring that our party's policies, our government's approach to things, reflects the reality of people's lives. I'm very proud to represent an inner city community in London, and I love the community, and I listen very carefully to what they all say, as I do on all the traveling around the country. The function of leadership is to understand the stresses that people face in their daily lives, the frustrations, the thwarted ambition, the anger that they face, and try to produce policies that make that different. Being strong and standing up doesn't necessarily mean shouting, dictating, and instructing. It's how you put your case. So, as you well know, I do not indulge in personal abuse. I think it's appalling, the abuse that's thrown at individual colleagues in the shadow cabinet, in, in the trade unions, the appalling abuse that's thrown around on the social media, and the very dark places it drives people into when that abuse takes place. So I want to set an example, an example that you don't indulge in that. You debate the issues that we all face and come to solutions that we can all collectively accept and be enthusiastic and excited by. And you know what? This is something that has brought more than half a million people into membership of our party because they're excited about what we can do together for the good of everybody else. Gentlemen, on that note, thank you to all of you, thank you to all of the colleagues that have made this amazing document which we're very proud to stand by. And ladies and gentlemen, with your support, your hard work and your dedication over the next three and a half weeks, please say thank you to your next Prime Minister. Let's all gather around. Well, these manifesto launches are often up and down affairs. Uh, questions from journalists and from 
uh, supporters, and as we saw there on a number of occasions, uh, the supporters booing uh, the journalist for asking questions, uh, including the journalist from the Daily Mirror, uh, a Labour-supporting newspaper, uh, but then the journalist from the Morning Star asked what could be done about the biased media. Uh, it has to be said, though, uh, whatever people make of the contents of the Labour manifesto, it was a uh, good-tempered and articulate uh, performance uh, by Jeremy Corbyn, uh, which I suspect uh, will not have done his own personal standing any harm. Uh, well, with me is Tamara Cohen, who is uh, covering the Labour campaign for Sky News this election. Uh, Tamara, what stood out for you from uh, the uh, 40 minutes or so we've just heard? I think a lot of it was as we expected, a lot of rhetoric about taxing the wealthy in order to provide more money for public services. A couple of things stood out for me. On the nationalisations of key industries, which we knew about before and we heard today, uh, railways when the licences come up, energy companies, water companies we heard today, that wasn't in the costings. We have this detailed document which apparently uh, shows all the costings. Labour are planning to spend for 48.6 billion and bring in 48.6 billion for taxes all of that uh, nationalization what they call capital spending money for infrastructure uh, money for the 10 pound minimum wage none of that is included in here and when a journalist asked about how much they would borrow to fund all that uh, Jeremy Corbyn couldn't say he didn't want to say he he said that uh, that everything had been fully costed there's some bigger glaring holes in terms of borrowing well this event of course took place in a university University of Bradford mm -hmm and long and sustained cheers uh, when he said that he would abolish university tuition fees. But the cost of that is absolutely enormous. Uh, out of a total cheers. of uh, 48 billion they're raising uh, a quarter of it. Absolutely. Education takes up a huge amount of what they're spending. Uni abolishing university fees, also uh, reversing cuts to schools, uh, further education. Education is a big, big part of it. I'm sure Jeremy Corbyn sees that as a winning uh, formula, but certainly the experts of the IFS uh, point out that not only is this a huge commitment, they actually put it at 13 billion. Jeremy Corbyn's just budgeted uh, for 11. But they say that what happens is that not only is it a huge drain on resources, but it tends to benefit those graduates who go on to earn the most later on and official figures the government say show that the number of people from deprived backgrounds going to university has not gone down as some had speculated that it would do as a result of increases in intuition fees so uh, actually when I was at a, a, a college with Jeremy Corbyn last week um, not far from here actually I was talking to some of the young people not all of them thought that abolishing tuition fees was a great idea and they're the generation who are about to go to university. What about uh, Mr Corbyn himself he uh, said it wasn't a personality cult on the other hand, a very pointed personal mm. challenge to Theresa May. Very much. He says that, you know, you're calling me back with looking. What about this Prime Minister who's bringing back fox hunting and uh, bringing back grammar schools? Interesting, what we discussed this morning, his line about the Tories being mean-spirited and tight-fisted, that was in the uh, brief uh, comments we got last night that he was going to say this morning. He ended up not saying that, and I wonder if they thought it just went too far in putting off swing voters. I mean, Labour do need uh, to win over people who voted Conservative, and I wonder why they left that line out. He made it clear, though, he's still pressing for a face-to-face -face television debate. Absolutely. Theresa May has said she won't do one. Jeremy Corbyn said he won't do one without her. Sky News are hosting the first uh, yeah. TV event of the campaign in which they'll uh, take questions back from a back, live audience yeah. back to back, but they won't actually debate each other. I mean, Jeremy Corbyn clearly feels that he might excel in that sort of situation to put the Prime Minister on the spot. Uh, Theresa May is having none of it. She says she wants to have uh, interactions with voters instead. Well, the Conservative launch coming up later in the week, most likely Thursday, we're not quite sure. Uh, tomorrow night's going to be the Liberal Democrats. But let's just remind ourselves of what's gone on in the last hour and the presentation of his manifesto by the Labour leader, Jeremy Corbyn. Let me highlight just a few of our key pledges. And believe it or not, you may have read them already. <laughs> if you're an assiduous reader of newspapers. We're ruling out rises in VAT and national insurance and on income tax for all but 5% of the highest earners. Labour will boost the wages of 5.7 million people earning less than the living wage to £10 an hour by 2020. Labour will scrap tuition fees, lifting the debt...
and that will lift the debt cloud from hundreds of thousands of young people. A government that invests for all. A government with a vision to ensure that the brilliance and imagination of every child can be fulfilled during their lifetime. Our proposal is a government for the many, not the few. Our proposals are of hope for the many all over this country. And I'm very proud to present our manifesto for the many, not the few. Thank you very much. Well, reaction is already coming in. Uh, we've had this from the battle bus of Tim Farron, the Liberal Democrat leader. The Labour manifesto became completely meaningless the moment Jeremy Corbyn ordered the Labour MPs to vote with UKIP and the Conservatives for that most extreme version of Brexit. It renders pretty much everything in the manifesto fairly irrelevant as a result of all that. And what we're saying as Liberal Democrats is that there is a brighter future for Britain where we are honest and straightforward about how we're going to have better health services, better schools, where we're honest with the people and say, look, it will cost a penny on income tax to make sure that our hospitals are well funding, that everybody is cared for properly. The problem with Labour's manifesto today is it is not really worth the paper it's written, off, given, written on, given that Jeremy Corbyn voted with UKIP and Theresa May on the biggest issue of the day. Well, Tim Farron there uh, saying that the Liberal Democrats would raise uh, income tax by a penny. Uh, with me now is uh, Andrew Gwynne, who is the campaign manager for Labour. Welcome to you. Hi. I mean, uh, in terms of the tax take, uh, the uh, 48 billion you're going to raise, I mean, that's the equivalent of 10p on the basic rate of income tax. But look, Adam, we're doing it and we've set it out in detail in a really fair way. We've made a pledge to the people of this country that there'll be no increases in VAT, there'll be no increases in national insurance contributions. Well, there will be an increase and, in VAT and, on and, private and, schools. And, and for the very top 5% of earners in this country, there will be an increase in income tax. We think that's a fair way of funding our public services that have been decimated under no, seven years of conservative. I understand that. I wasn't talking about the specifics. I was just saying the size of the amount you want to raise uh, is, roughly speaking, about 10% of government spending at the moment. So that, that but we've is, got an ambitious that is a massive program. increase. We've it? got an ambitious program for government. You've heard today some of the ideas that we're setting out. We're finally saying we want to fully fund the NHS. We want to make sure our children have the best opportunities in education. We want to lift uh, students from the burden of debt yeah. and we want to care for our elderly and secure their pensions as well. So, and that is an ambitious, radical programme for government. So Adam. if the overall tax take went to more than 50%, would that be a problem? Because with these figures, it's going to get quite close to that, isn't it? But Adam, you know, this is the first time, probably in a very long time, that an opposition party has set out in so much detail not only yeah. its programme for government, but how we intend to fund those pledges. I think our job now is to go out oh. to the country, is to speak to the people, and to urge them to vote Labour on June the 8th for a better Britain, a but, Britain that no, works I'm, for the I'm, many, I'm, not I the few. I understand that. I mean, I have to say. Uh, one person was tweeting, I like this alternative reality. By the way, I'm married to George Clooney. I mean, they, they didn't see it as being remotely affordable. Well, we're saying it is affordable, and we've set out precisely how we are going to make this work. And I think this is a radical departure from the way politics has been done in recent years. We're saying if you want good quality public services, if you want to live in a fairer, more just, more equal society, you have to make sure that those at the top pay their fair way and make sure that we spread the equality across the whole country. And that's why I am really yeah. excited about the programme that we've set out in our manifesto today. But there is only so much money in the national cake. I'm asking you how much you think the state, the government should take, because it seems to me what you're really saying is more than 50 pence in every pound should go to the gentleman in Whitehall to decide how to spend. No, what we're saying, Adam, is that we want to fully fund our public services. We want to make the sure that thing, our schools, our nurseries, our hospitals are well looked after. The people of this country yeah. have opportunities yeah. that are currently denied them. We want a fairer Britain. No, I understand and that. that's but, what but our you, manifesto you understand is the philosophy. all about. We had a chat from the Morning Star standing up. All I'm saying is this is a move back quite significantly, as you yourself would admit, 
towards the state taking more of the national wealth to spend as it sees fit. This is about making sure Britain operates in a fair and more equal way. Uh, you know, there's always money for those at the top when it comes right. to priorities of the current okay. government. There's never enough money what for people. What do you think the people. impact will be over this parliament of uh, taking this money from business, taking this money from top earners? Uh, precedent would say that will lead to a slowdown in the economy. Would you Absolutely accept? not. We are looking at growing the economy. We are looking at making sure that the economy succeeds, that jobs are put first, investment is put into everything that we do in every region of the country, in every nation I, of the country. I appreciate country. that's what you and want that, to do. That I'm, a, ju well, I'm, I'm just saying the impact might be that, to... That is an important way of drive driving the economy up growth. Into a wall, well, it it's all, it, I would say that the country, it's a way that we drive uh, growth in equally across the nations and the regions of this country in a way that hasn't been done for a very long time. I think this is an exciting yeah. programme. I, I understand your pessimism, but I think no, this no, is... No, I'm just asking I, you about the I structure think, of it. I think yeah. this is really but exciting. What, but, what, and in five years' time, you asked me what yeah. the outcome would be, in five years' time, Britain will be a fairer, more equal, more just place and than just it is to be, today. And just to be clear, Jeremy Corbyn did say the people have voted to come out of the European Union, but as I understood it, nothing specific on controlling immigration from the European Union or anywhere else. Is that well, right? Well, I think you heard Jeremy, you must have heard Jeremy say that when we come out of the European Union, free movement will end. There will be migration controls from uh, within the European Union. But we want a fair migration system that mm. means that our economy uh, isn't damaged. So, yes, where there are job shortages, where there are skill shortages, uh, if people who live in the European Union can come here and fill those shortages in the NHS, in agriculture, we want foreign students to come to yeah. our universities You're not as putting well. any limit on, um, it, uh, on well, numbers, like uh, Mrs May is, apparently. Well, saying, Mrs right? May has put limits on numbers. She's not been very successful at achieving no, those. Uh, but you're I, not, I think we I need to be it. We need to be flexible to the needs of the British economy, uh, not cutting off our noses to spite our faces, because there will be times where we do need overseas migration uh, to fill those skills gaps and also to ensure that universities like this remain well funded through uh, foreign students as well. And just on that, will foreign students get free tuition as well? Well, look, I think the important thing is here that British students will get free yeah. tuition. We're not talking about that for overseas students because overseas, that... overseas students uh, pay their way, keep these uh, universities so they'll going. So go, they'll go on paying. Um, yeah. And this is about British students getting a fair deal, getting the opportunities they need. And I think that's really exciting for all the young people that were here cheering us on because uh, this, this is their future. Certainly Adam. a popular proposal, no doubt about that, in this uh, University of Bradford. Mr Gwynne, thank you very much indeed. Thank you. No tax rises for 95% of earners, more money for the NHS and social care and scrapping tuition fees. A short while ago, Jeremy Corbyn la launched the Labour Party manifesto saying that the policies in it were for the few, were for the many, not the few. Let's remind you then of those key announcements uh, made this morning. Jeremy Corbyn pledged his party will nationalise the railways, the energy sector and the Royal Mail. Also that news on the uh, regional water boards as well. Mm. On taxation, no income tax rises for those earning less than £80,000 a year and no VAT on national insurance rises either. But there would be increases for those who earn more than £80,000 a year. Uh, Labour would scrap the Conservative government's white paper plans on Brexit. There'd be an extra £6 billion a year for the NHS. And the triple lock on state pensions would be guaranteed. Let's turn to our economics editor, Ed Conway, who's been looking at Labour's proposals. Ed, welcome to you. How do they stack up? Uh, well, this is, I mean, I've got to say, I've got the, the, the full uh, PDF, the full document here, and we'll go through uh, it uh, point by point, although I I'm not going to be able to go through every page. It's one of the longer manifestos I can remember in recent years, 128 pages uh, in all. Uh, and here it is, for the many, not for the few. The key question I think many people will be asking is uh, whether it all adds up, and we'll come to that in full detail uh, in just a moment. Uh, but they are keen uh, to point out that the manifesto, as far as they're concerned, uh, is fully costed. All current spending uh, paid for out of taxation and a lot more taxation uh, or redirected revenue streams. Uh, and then there's this as well, setting the target of eliminating the government's deficit on day-to-day -day spending within five years. So there are some big promises there on the fiscal side. The question I think a lot of people will have, and there are lots of numbers here, which I'll come to in a second, is whether they are really reliable. Uh, and of course, 
the big picture, one of the biggest stories that you just mentioned a moment ago uh, there, uh, is that taxes are set to go up for the top 5% of the population. They talk about a fair taxation system. This is really relatively early on in the document. There's not all that much detail about it, uh, but these are the key things. Uh, a Labour government will guarantee no rises in income tax for those earning uh, below £80,000 a year. If you earn over £80,000 a year, you will have to pay the 45 rate of tax. Now that was previously only if you were earning over £150,000 a year. A lot more people will end up paying tax as a result of that. And then for higher earners, it's a return to the 50p rate. So the top 5% will have to pay more. The 50p rate is coming back, but that's only for those earning over £124,000 uh, a year. Labour think that's going to bring in uh, quite a fair whack of, uh, of money, £4.5 uh, billion pounds just for that on its own. Uh, Nationalisations, you mentioned another one of the big... Uh, kind of topics that I think a lot of people are focusing on. Uh, that's covered in here as well, widening ownership of the economy. Uh, let's go through some of the bullet points here. So bringing back private rail companies uh, into public ownership. Uh, you've got re uh, regaining control of energy supply networks as well through alteration of operator licenses. Uh, and then you've got the water system, renationalisation there as well, and then reversing the privatisation uh, of Royal Mail. Now, some people have asked the question, a very legitimate question, as to how they're going to afford to pay for this and why the numbers aren't there. Well, the numbers aren't there because no one quite knows how much it would cost to do these renationalizations. It would be very expensive. You're talking about tens of billions of pounds. As for whether Labour have to map out precisely how much that's going to cost in day-to-day -day spending, they don't really have to do that because that, that, that they would count as investment and they're not counting that against their borrowing figures. So they are able to leave that as a slightly greyer uh, area uh, and it's not in the, the numbers that we'll come to in a second. Schools, lots of spending uh, on schools. There's just Jeremy Corbyn. He does appear quite a few times uh, in this manifesto, just underlining how much of a personality contest uh, this has become. Uh, but actually about half of the extra spending uh, that Labour are proposing is going to be on schools and universities, of course, reversing tuition fee, uh, fees. That's going to be a, a very expensive, costly policy, which we'll come to again in a moment. And benefits. This is the interesting thing. You would have thought, actually, that this being the Labour Party, they would have reversed the government's freeze on benefits, working tax credits. But actually, having flicked through this a number of times, there's lots on pensioners. You can see you know, plenty of the pictures there. But there's not all that much in the way uh, in terms of working tax credits on whether they rever reverse that freeze, which is odd because that's one of the big things pushing up inequality over the next few years. There is, of course, uh, scrapping the bedroom tax. Uh, we've heard from that Jeremy Corbyn uh, a fair few times about that. Uh, reinstating housing benefit for under-21s. Um, but I think people will ask the question, why are you not saying explicitly that you're going to get rid of that Conservative uh, cap, the Conservative freeze on benefits? There's nothing clearly uh, on this, just a lot, as I say, uh, about pensioners. And they keep the triple lock. Again, not a costed policy. That's something that over the course of the next few decades, the Office of Budget Responsibility, the IFS, all sorts of people have said that will cost tens of billions, if not hundreds of billions of pounds. And yet that's not costed here. But in fairness, the government, it is currently their policy uh, and they haven't costed it either. Now, there is on top of the overall manifesto, they provided this, funding Britain's future. They, it is a full costing of their day-to-day -day spending. And it's quite interesting. Normally in manifestos, you don't get these kind of tables. Uh, and yet they have been included here. Uh, by my reckoning, actually, the last party to do something like this was actually UKIP in the last election in 2015. All of the main parties thought they wouldn't bother including them. Um, but clearly Labour wants to show that it has thought this through. And indeed, here are all of their spending commitments. And you can see them here. Uh, schools, education, there's a lot basically here uh, about education. Uh, you're talking about a considerable amount, amount there. You've got health and social care uh, there. We're talking a lot about health yesterday, weren't we? So five billion pounds extra on health. And this is all by 2021, 22. Uh, social security, I was mentioning benefits there again. Where is the question of the benefits freeze? Doesn't seem to be there. Uh, paternity leave, these are relatively small things. Uh, and then that's the only kind of amount of spending that we've got on uh, pensions, 300 million pounds. That wouldn't cover uh, the triple lock. Um, but then you've got the public sector pay cap. That's something Jeremy Corbyn has talked about. When you, when you trot it all up, and remember here, we've got Barnet consequentials. That basically means that for all of the spending here, whether it's on schools, uh, whether it's on police, whether it's on other parts of the public sector, you need to pay uh, for the equivalent in Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland. When you add it all up, that costs £48.6 billion a year by 2021 to 22. That's the end of the next parliament. Now, can they make that up with all of their tax rises? Well, they say... 
Surprise, surprise, they can. Um, and the main thing bringing in money is this one, corporation tax. And you can see the rising corporation tax, actually it's a reversal of what the Conservatives did to corporation tax in the last few years, they say would bring in 19.4 billion pounds. A lot of people are quite skeptical because when you're pushing up ca uh, tax rates, often companies shift their profits overseas. That might well happen this time around, or indeed work less. Then you've got the income tax increases for the top 5%. That brings in £6.4 billion. Pounds. Not enormous, actually, in the grand scheme of things, but it underlines that it's quite difficult to raise that much money off people who are already paying about half of the total tax in the UK. It's about 46 47%. Now, when you toss everything up and you've got various bits and pieces like an offer, an offshore company property le uh, levy. Uh, predictably, you've got the uh, tax avoidance programme. Every single government ever has said that they're going to raise money off tax avoidance. When the numbers have actually come in, it's turned out to be far more difficult. But it is useful for, uh, for adding an extra few billion pounds uh, to, your, to your figures. There is, I should say, uh, this, and this is quite important, allowance made for behavioural change. Basically, they are concerned that when they raise these taxes, some people will essentially move out of the country or stop earning as much money, uh, and that will mean that the tax rate won't be quite as much. But tot it all up, and there you have it. 48.6 billion. Labour says it's fully costed. A lot in here. We'll be digging it all over it over the course of the next few hours. Uh, but interesting stuff to start off with. Some pretty forensic accounting there. Thanks very much indeed. Now, Jeremy Corbyn launched his party's manifesto at the University of Bradford in the last hour. Uh, let's give you a quick reminder of what he had to say. Let me highlight just a few of our key pledges. And believe it or not, you may have read them already. <laughs> if you're an assiduous reader of newspapers. We're ruling out rises in VAT and national insurance and on income tax for all but 5% of the highest earners. Labour will boost the wages of 5.7 million people earning less than the living wage to £10 an hour by 2020. Labour will scrap tuition fees, lifting the debt... And that will lift the debt cloud from hundreds of thousands of young people. A government that invests for all. A government with the vision to ensure that the brilliance and imagination of every child can be fulfilled during their lifetime. Our proposal is a government for the many, not the few. Our proposals are of hope for the many all over this country. And I'm very proud to present our manifesto for the many, not the few. Thank you very much. Well, let's talk about this a little bit more with Fazia Shaheen, the director of the think tank for the Centre of Labour and Social Studies. She joins us now live. We're also going to be talking to Julian Jessup, the chief executive of the Institute of Economic Affairs, in a couple of moments. Uh, to you first, though, uh, Fazia. Um, he... He... Do you think this is the right direction that Jeremy Corbyn is taking for the party? Tax more, spend more, borrow more. Do you think this is the right message? So I've been thinking about these proposals in the context of where we are in terms of the economy, in terms of society, right? So we've got, we know we've got nurses going to food banks. We know we've got public services that are crippled, uh, cash poor. Um, we've got a situation whereby consumer debt, so household debt, is back up to levels that it was at financial, uh, before the financial crisis. Clearly something is not working. So when you look at these types of policies, they are sensible in terms of dealing with the real challenges. But, but the Conservative Party would, would say that the reasons that we have the country in this state is because because of past Labour policies of overspending and overborrowing. Well, that is actually just wrong. What happened with the financial crisis, of course, is that we saw a massive disruption to our economy. And what happens when there's a re recession is that governments have to pay more in benefits because there's more people employed. They have to invest more to counter the private investment that's taken out. Now, if we want to do something about the budget deficit, then we have to ask who has the best growth plan. So because if we look at the growth plan, that will create more tax receipts and that will result in the government having more money to pay off that deficit. So we've actually been focusing on the wrong side of the equation for the last seven years. And that's why we 
we haven't seen growth in what, the way we would have expected, why we've seen wages stagnated, because we haven't been making the right investments. OK, well, let's bring in Julian Jessup from the Institute for Economic Affairs. Um, do you think more borrowing, more spending will lead to more economic growth? Uh, no, I don't. I think it's exactly the wrong direction in which to, to move. I mean, the record for many other countries is that a combination of in increased spending, increased taxation, increased regulation, increased state ownership, increased state setting of prices and wages is actually counterproductive to growth. And I'm afraid that a lot of the Labour Party proposals can be criticised on that basis. Um, Fazia, looking at some of the papers today, the Daily Mail perhaps not surprisingly going on the attack already, they described it as a tax war on the middle class. Uh, do you not think it may be perceived as that? I mean, it's interesting that the Daily Mail's taken that line. Of course, what we, what's been very clear is that 95% of us will not see tax rises um, in our incomes or in VAT or national insurance. I was thinking about it with a friend the other day, and we couldn't think of anyone we knew that earned 80,000, any one of our friends that earned 80,000 pounds a year. And so what we're talking about here is a fair taxation system. We know that we're in trouble in terms of our public services, in terms of investing for the future, whether that be about climate change or technological change. We have to make key investments now. So where, where we place that burden, it seems right to ask those that have benefited most from economic growth and uh, economic prosperity in the last 30 to 40 years, that top 5%, in particular the top 1%, have been taking a bigger and bigger share of the pie. It seems fair to ask that 5% to put in more. Uh, Julian Jessup, isn't it fair? Uh, shouldn't we be taxing those who earn such a great deal more? Will it bring more money into the economy? Well, first of all, we are already taxing the relatively wealthy quite a lot more than we were in the past. Um, but there's a more general point here. I think that this misunderstands where the burden of taxation ultimately falls. Um, the bulk of the money that Labour is planning to get will be from, from corporations, but that's ultimately reflected in, in higher prices for consumers, lower um, wages for, for workers, fewer jobs created. Uh, and a hit on shareholders as well, small shareholders as well as large ones. So the idea that um, you can just tax corporations and the so-called rich without any impact on the rest of us, on the wider economy, is simply mistaken. Uh, and isn't it the case also, for Fazia, that, that in the past, when tax rates were increased for the very wealthy, that actually the amount of money that came back into the economy f through taxation went down? Uh, so there's some tricky figures on that because actually people ended up moving their money around and paying it well, in a different way yeah, because is they knew that it was going to go money down into the economy. Again. Tricky think, or not, it's, it simply means there's less money in the economy. No, so, so essentially what people did was avoid the tax. Now, when people avoid taxes and essentially is bad behaviour, do we reward them by giving them a lower tax rate? I don't think so. I think we do more to plug that hole. And look, in general, tax seems to get a really bad rep. Tax is the reason that we have schools and hospitals. It's actually why businesses stay here. If they don't have an educated workforce, if they don't have good roads and infrastructure to use, then that is most likely to get them to leave, not tax rates. And let's be clear here, the corporation tax that the Labour Party has announced is pretty modest. It's not higher than other OECD countries. It's, it actually still leaves us at a competitive rate. What we're doing right now is... Uh, really pushing the rates so low that we're sparking a race to the bottom. Businesses benefit from society, they benefit from our workers that are educated by public money and so therefore they should give back. Uh, Julian Jessup, do, do you think that the, the amount that the Labour Party are suggesting they will raise, £19.4 billion, do you think that increasing the corporate tax rate, given the effect of Brexit, will deter people from coming to the UK or, or is it moderate enough to actually not really be, be a hindrance to some big companies? No, I think it will be a big problem. It is true that the corporation tax rates that Labour is talking about are close to the OECD average, but the key point is that most countries are moving down. When one talks about a race to the bottom, that's precisely because most economists, uh, most policymakers recognise that high corporate taxes are a bad thing rather than a good thing. And indeed, a lot of what Labour says, particularly the rhetoric around fat cats and punishing businesses and excessive salaries, is exactly the wrong sort of signal to send when we're trying to say that Britain is open for business after Brexit. Uh, talking of, of, of signals, uh, Fazia, the Conservatives have released their response to Jeremy Corbyn's manifesto. David Gorg, Chief Secretary to the Treasury, saying this may be Jeremy Corbyn's manifesto, but the costings behind it are pure Diane Abbott. Uh, and isn't this really Labour's problem that it, despite it releasing this secondary document with all of their costings in it, there is still a perception that the Labour Party are not good with the economy. Yeah, there's some really spiteful comments going around. I mean, I think you're right in that 
what the Labour Party hasn't done in the last seven years is to really counter that narrative that it was all Labour's fault. Of course it wasn't Labour's fault. It was the bankers' fault. It was a financial crisis. Um, so there needs to be more there and there's not a lot of time to be done that. I mean, I think one of the most interesting things on the way here, I was thinking, what if we had a costings of not investing? If we, if people out there that have their homes, that have their cars, they know you have to pay for upkeep. We are not doing that in our economy and that will cost us hugely late, later on. Julian Jessup? Do you think it was the bankers' fault or the Labour Party's fault that we're in the pickle that we're in now? Oh, I think lots of people contributed to it. I think there's no doubt that the, the regulation of the, the banks was too loose. Um, policymakers, both Conservative and Labour, have contributed to that. Uh, there are also other factors. I think interest rates were kept low for, for too long. Uh, but that's playing the blame game. Um, I think as it happens, Labour's record is pretty poor. The Tories track record is pretty poor, particularly on fiscal policy, and I expect to be criticising them heavily for what they might be saying on intervention in labour markets and other aspects over the next few days. Uh, but looking forward, the question for me is what are the best solutions to these problems? And I'm sure they're far more likely to be free market ones than more government, more state intervention. Fazia? Free market is what brought us the financial crisis. I mean, I think clearly uh, we need some intervention in some areas. The market works where there's a profit motive, and it works. I mean, but we're applying that market motive to areas whereby there's only one company, or it's very hard to have that competition that's needed for profit motives to work. Look, we need intervention. Some of the most economies that we look up to the most, Germany, Denmark, Sweden, where they have um, much more social cohesion, where they have um, much better services. Those are places where the government invests. It's just a strategic investment. It's not taking over. It's about the government play, uh, playing its part and business playing its part. Uh, uh, very briefly, Julian, because we haven't got very much time, but, but we have seen some of this from the Conservatives as well, haven't we? We've seen Theresa May talking about intervening in energy pricing. So this may be something that we're going to see in the Conservative manifesto as well, potentially. Oh, absolutely. I'm, I'm worried in a way, although Labour's likely to, to lose the, the war, it's winning some of the battles. And the, the way that the Conservatives are, are lurching towards the left in many of these proposals is something that genuinely concerns me. Over the last few days, I've been very critical of what Labour is doing. But over the next few days, I think the attention is going to shift to the Conservatives. And their record and their proposals are not that great either. OK. Julian Jessup and Fazia Shaheed, thank you both very much for joining us.